waiting room. Uh, so we'll give everyone um, a couple of minutes to get connect, okay. connect, connected Sounds and then good. we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, Theo. Hi there, Hank. Thank you again for this invitation. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for joining. Oh, it's good of to course. have you. Thank you. Um, so if you two don't mind, I'd, I'd be happy to um, talk about this issue from um, the perspective of, um, of a museum and also as an educator. Um, I'd, I'd like to kind of bring in a historical, um, uh, an historical frame that, that thinks about um, or that places this in, in a certain kind of context. Um, but I'll, I'll do so with an object that I recently collected for the National Museum of American History and see where we can go from there. Perfect. And congrats on your new position. Thank you. Condolences are also appreciated as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, the history of America is not told without the history of every people that built it. This is true. Yeah, I think we're, we're joined by about 30 people right now. So to all of you who have just joined us from the waiting room, thank you for coming today. Uh, we're gonna give people a minute or two to get to get connected to the line and then we'll go ahead and get started. So while we're letting people come in, I'm just gonna give a very brief welcome and introduction. So my name is Courtney Weatherby. I'm the Deputy Director and Research Analyst for the Southeast Asia Program at the Stimson Center. Uh, and I'm delighted to help sort of run things behind the scenes for today's discussion on combating violence against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. So I'm gonna turn things over very shortly to my colleague, Bill Weiss, who will moderate today's session. Uh, but in the meantime, I just wanted to let you all know that this is uh, a sort of an open discussion. So we are recording it and we'll later be posting it on the website. Um, if you have questions at any point throughout the conversation, please go ahead and enter them into the question and answer function that's located at the bottom of your screen. So we're gonna let the panelists uh, give their remarks and have a discussion with Bill. Um, and then I'll jump back on towards the end of the session to help moderate the Q&A session. So thank you all for joining us. I hope that we'll have a substantive discussion today. And Bill, I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to you. Thanks, Courtney. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, everyone in the East, uh, good afternoon. Good morning to those of you on the West Coast uh, uh, watching us and good very early morning or very late night to our friends in Southeast Asia who have joined us. Wherever on the globe you find yourself, we're very glad that you could be part of the Southeast Asia Forum's Philippine Roundtable event on combating anti-Asian violence in the US and beyond. As Courtney said, my name is Bill Wise. I chair the Southeast Asia Forum and the Philippine Roundtable. The Forum's a project of the Southeast Asia Program uh, at the Stimson Center. And we exist to promote the study of Southeast Asia and US-Southeast Asia relations at colleges, universities, and research institutions in the Mid-Atlantic region, but also uh, quite far beyond. You can find out more about our various activities uh, like uh, this particular seminar uh, at our web pages on the Stimson uh, Center website. We are very grateful to Henry Howard, a member of our advisory council, and two anonymous donors for supporting our twice monthly webinars. You can support our programs by becoming a friend of the forum. More information on this is available on our web pages. Today, our discussion focuses on a timely and consequential issue for Americans and Southeast Asians alike. Violence, and here I include all hate crimes directed against Asian Americans in the US and against Asians in other countries. This topic is a little different from ones that we pursued over the last year, but it's no less important to our regular audience, to our particular audience today, and to American society as, as a whole. The March 16th shooting of six Asian Americans at three spas in Atlanta and the senseless assault on an Asian American woman in, on a New York street focused the attention of uh, the nation on hate crimes against Asian Americans. These events also catalyzed Asian American leaders to speak out, moved Americans of all backgrounds to listen to their fellow citizens, and launched a national search for solutions. Defining the problem is the natural beginning point in this process, and this requires us to look at the facts in a systematic manner. So I pose some questions that I hope we'll at least think about, if not uh, discuss further in, in this seminar. What's the nature and extent of crimes against Asian Americans motivated by racial bias? 
who are the victims of hate crimes based on anti-Asian uh, bias? Where are uh, hate crimes against anti-Asian Americans committed? And by whom are these hate crimes committed? Well, we have information on this subject in the FBI's Uniform Crime Reporting System that was established by the Hate Crimes Statistics Act in 19, uh, of 1990, and in the reports of local and state law enforcement agencies that make up the FBI uh, database. In short, recent data indicates that hate crimes against Asian Americans have risen significantly in the year of COVID-19. But some observers also worry that hate crimes against Asians are significantly underreported. How good is the data then? What are the cultural uh, factors that might enter into reporting hate crimes and thus validating our database? More subjective is the issue of why. What motivates the perpetrators of anti-Asian violence? Is it racial prejudice? A result of political incitement? Fear of COVID-19? Something else? There's a surfeit of opinion on the question of motivation. The case of the Atlanta shooter, however, demonstrates that very clearly that there are differences. So what does social science research actually tell us about the motives behind anti-Asian violence in the United States and beyond? Well, we need incontrovertible facts and rigorous analysis to find policy solutions to the rise of violence uh, directed against Asian Americans in the US and elsewhere. How can law enforcement agencies better address the problems of violence in our communities? How can lawmakers and local officials use data and analysis to create meaningful remedies? What can students, faculty members and researchers do to identify and explain trends and propose solutions? What are the foreign policy implications of the rising number of attacks against Asian Americans? We have three very distinguished experts to address these questions and other questions on the subject of violence directed against Asian Americans and uh, Asians elsewhere uh, in the world. And I'll introduce them in just a moment. But first, I need to make three important announcements, one of which is repeating uh, what Courtney has said, but uh, rules are the rules, and we need to make sure that everyone understands this. First, this event is on the record. So you may use, if you are a student, a faculty member, or a researcher, you may use information developed uh, through this seminar. Second, this event is being recorded and will appear on the Southeast Asia Forum web pages on the Stimson Center website. And finally, after our three speakers have made the remarks, we'll have a brief moderated conversation followed by a question and answer session. So our first speaker is a distinguished diplomat, journalist, and uh, media business leader in the Philippines, uh, and a very good friend of the Southeast Asia Forum, now is sitting in Washington, DC. Uh, His Excellency, the Philippine Ambassador to the United States, Jose, Jose Manuel G. Uh, Romaldez. You can find a very interesting commentary by Ambassador Romaldez uh, in our Ambassador's Corner section of the Southeast Asia Forum web pages. Ambassador Romaldez's <laughs> full bio and the bios of our other two speakers are available on your invitation. So I have, uh, I will uh, uh, summarize them very briefly uh, as I have done with Ambassador Romaldez, but I urge you to look at the invitation for the full uh, biographic uh, background information. So, Ambassador Romaldez, uh, it's good to see you, sir, and welcome good back. You, Bill. Welcome back to the Southeast Asia Forum at Stimson. It's always good to have you here. Thank you very much, Bill. I appreciate it, and I uh, thank you for having me. Uh, well, let me greet our uh, co-panelist, uh, Mr. Theodore Gonzalez, and uh, Senator Lee, and of course Courtney, who's uh, here, and Hank Hendrickson for inviting me to this uh, important forum. Uh, with the U.S. Philippine Society, um, and I look forward actually to Maryland State Senator and Majority Whip Susan Lee on her state's perspective and proposed measures to combat the anti-Asian violence, and also, of course, the remarks of Dr. Theo Gonzalez for his insights into the broader impact of the anti-Asian and Pacific Islander hate on the AIPI community. 
Anti-Asian sentiments and crimes are not something new, but what is alarming is a significant increase of anti-Asian hate incidents, which appears directly attributable to the ongoing pandemic and biases arising from reports on its origins. I learned that anti-Asian hate crimes have surged about 150% since the pandemic began. Just last Friday, CNBC reported that 81% of Asian American adults say violence against them has risen while 56% of all US adults believe AAPI violence has risen in the last year alone. I recently attended a vigil and support event for some of the Filipino victims of AAPI hate. We saw the disturbing manifestations of this hate and verbal harassment, verbal abuse, passive aggressive activities and reactions to direct the physical assault and mutilation and incapacitating attacks. Worse, these victims often feel lost and helpless because their ordeal seems to have fallen on deaf ears. Consider too that our Asian culture and predilection typically compels us to present a stoic and inscrutable demeanor and a quiet approach, even in the face of adversity. But we should all be reminded that what is presently confronting is an injustice that cannot be ignored or passed over. I know that deep down, we all realize this. Victims have often been confronted by AAPI haters yelling for them to go back home, that there is no place in America for Asians. What many people might not know is that Asians are not recent immigrants to the United States. In fact, Filipino sailors settled in Louisiana's bios even before the US Revolutionary War. These hardy Filipino sailors worked on the galleon trade between the Philippines and Mexico and eventually found their way to the United States. In the same event, I shared that we must continue to support our anti-Haitian or anti-Haitian hate victims, encourage our communities and fellow Asians to speak up and report incidents and remind friends and family that we are all here to help without being judgmental. In fact, sharing and reporting these incidents reinforces and builds up our communities. By speaking up, people in power are better able to help and at the same time, policy and decision makers are prompted to undertake immediate and concrete action. Everyone must do their part to make sure that this biased, violent hate does not go unnoticed and unpunished wherever and wherever or to whomever it may occur. I am, however, hopeful that people are now more mindful of the negative environment, the victims, the pain and the suffering that Asian and Pacific Islander minorities have endured. These are some of the daunting and horrific realities faced by American citizens of AAPI descent. Those who we know are contributing and upstanding members of society, to put it more personally, our friends, family, neighbors, people you do business with daily, and people who hold important roles in American society, such as healthcare and science and technology workers. And more noteworthy, recent weeks have been growing clarion call that something must be done now, not later. It is uplifting to hear, however, President Biden's statement last March 19, that hate and violence often hide in plain sight and is often met in silence. That's been true, out, true throughout our history that that has not has to be changed because silence is our complicity. We cannot be complicit. We have to speak out and we have to act. Quote from President Biden. The same sentiments have also been strongly echoed by Vice President Harris, who herself hails from Asian roots. For our part, we have reached out and persistently raised this issue with our contacts and partners in the US government and appropriate authorities. We have established communication, sought assistance, built networks and offered cooperation to those who are willing and able. Some Filipino organizations have been taken up upon, or have taken up upon themselves to organize actions addressing AAPI hate. Unlike COVID-19's indiscriminate way of spreading the infection, racial prejudice and discrimination is something that can be addressed through public and political discourse and social and political change. We can all take an active role in this. AAPI hate, or any kind of racial hate is unacceptable at all levels of society. Our present situation makes it the best for minorities to make representations and ensure that AAPI hate does not go unnoticed or unpunished. The Philippine Embassy and the consulates in the United States are here to support this unifying and righteous cause. 
we stand ready to cooperate and collaborate with partners in the fight against xenophobia. Every person, no matter what race or appearance, deserves a safe and dignified life. I look forward to listening to my fellow speakers on this very important issue today. Thank you very much. And, and thank you, Ambassador, and thank you for those very compelling and heartfelt remarks. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they resonate with all of us and we are, but they cannot be said often enough. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is State Senator Susan C. Lee. Senator Lee is an attorney and has served in the Maryland Senate since 2015, representing a Montgomery County district. She previously, previously served in the Maryland House of Delegates for 13 years. She's the first Asian American elected to uh, the Maryland State Senate and is a member of the Senate Democratic leadership serving as majority whip. She's been a leader in passing key legislation, including laws related to our discussion today to combat hate crimes, home invasions, crimes against immigrants, and human and labor trafficking. We are honored to have you with us today. Uh, Senator Lee, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to uh, be a part of this discussion, uh, and we are anxious to hear your remarks. And you are muted. Thank, thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, uh, Professor Weiss, and also uh, Hank um, Hendrickson and Courtney Witterby and their team and the Simpson Center's Southeast um, Asia Forum and also the U.S. Philippines uh, Society, but particularly my fellow panelists, His Excellency uh, Ramaris and also uh, uh, Dr. Theodore Gonzalez. Thank you. It's, it's uh, very proud to be with such esteemed speakers and uh, and advocates for uh, fighting this anti-Asian violence that has occurred and that is attacking our community. Uh, you know, very often we are perceived as uh, foreigners, uh, Asian American Pacific Islanders, even though we've been in this country for hundreds of years and we've made major, major contributions to America in the area of science, medicine, the arts, education, business, and a myriad of fields. And a lot of us, as uh, the ambassador said, have, have been here, uh, you know, moving the economy and all sorts of jobs, but we've also served in the US Armed Forces, including uh, my own father, uh, Harry Lee. He, he was a uh, World War II US Navy veteran who defended freedom on the perilous Atlantic and Pacific. And he was uh, doing this during one of the darkest times in the history of our world. And he was part of what they call the greatest generation. And a lot of Philippine Americans did so too. And uh, they faced a lot of injustices uh, when they came home and uh, in terms of uh, getting the benefits and citizenship that they were deserved of. Uh, despite being attacked during this pandemic, um, our community have uh, risen to the occasion and we've raised and donated hundreds and thousands of PPEs. Uh, so for our first responders and our healthcare providers. So we're doing our part. But um, Asian Americans, Pacific Islander, and peoples of all backgrounds, as you know, built this country. And as I was talking to Theodore, the, uh, the history of America is not complete unless we tell the history of all our people. And so I'm so glad about this forum because we're able to speak about this issue. Uh, so when President, former President uh, Donald Trump and some in very high office and those in very high trust uh, refer to the virus as Kung Flu or the China virus, uh, these words created a very toxic, volatile, and dangerous environment uh, that uh, I believe provoked uh, attacks and violence against our community and still continue to do so and put a real big bullseye on the back of our grandparents, our parents, uh, our children, our grandchildren, and uh, AAPIs. It's a very dangerous thing to, words matter. And uh, we, we are very concerned about those in high office saying those things and emboldening some of the more right-wing white supremacists. Uh, these attacks uh, are attacks against America because when you attack those in our community, you are attacking America and all Americans and the values and the principles we all hold dear. And these attacks are happening everywhere, as uh, the ambassador indicated. We, we had um, 
we had attacks uh, in California against the Thai American. We had attacks in New York. We had attacks in California, Louisiana, Arkansas. And it's gone up, as the ambassador said, by 150% at least. But we think that this is even underreported because uh, people in our community are sometimes afraid of retaliation. So um, we, we think that most of the attacks, the reason they're attacking women and particularly the elderly is because the perpetrators believe that they can get away with it because they probably have in the past. And they pick on these victims because uh, they feel that these victims will not fight back and they're, they're voiceless and they're marginalized and that they will never be prosecuted for their actions. And around the, uh, the, the country, we still hear these chilling reports of attacks. And we heard about the attack against a Filipino American woman in New York City who was stopped, violently stopped. And of course uh, there were bystanders, but they, they took no action, which was totally shocked and appalled me. And even in, in our great state of Maryland, which I represent, we had a family in Rockville, Maryland, whose home was attacked three times. And, it, and the perpetrators knew they were at home. It was, uh, they, they did it anyway. And uh, it was particularly chilling. And then we had uh, a woman in downtown Bethesda, which has a lot of great restaurants in the district. Uh, the woman was uh, verbally attacked and, and the perpetrator was, was about to threaten some violence. But fortunately the bystanders sprang up and they de-escalated the event, which is, I, I don't know who those bystanders are, but I wanna thank them. If you're watching this, thank you so much for coming to her aid because it could have been worse. Um, and um, I, I also had information um, in uh, the neighborhood, I don't know if you all know Chevy Chase, Maryland. It's a pretty well hill community. Uh, there were two incidences that were reported uh, because, but, but the uh, residents who were the subject of the attacks, they're, they're very fearful about reporting it because of possible retaliation. And it's a real thing too. It's a real thing about retaliation. So um, I want to commend everyone here for, um, from the bottom of my heart, from participating in this forum and, and finding ways that we can uh, take constructive action to fight this. First, I, I wanna offer some recommendations First, I believe it is almost imperative that our political leaders stand up and join us, our community, in strongly denouncing these attacks because it shows true leadership and sends a strong and clear message. And during our legislative session, I had to stand up twice. I didn't want to because I don't like to you know, grandstand, but sometimes you gotta get up on the floor. And I asked my colleagues to please join us and they did. Our Senate President, Bill Ferguson, did. He denounced these tax and he called for uh, unity. And our House Speaker, Adrian Jones, also did the same thing. And our uh, wonderful congressman that represents my district, Jamie Raskin, came to our aid too. His colleagues, Governor uh, Hogan and Mrs. Yumi Hogan, who's Korean American. And uh, just recently, um, there was an anti-hate crimes bill introduced by U.S. Senator Maisie Hirado and Congresswoman Grace Meng, who um, it passed, uh, it passed the Senate by a 94 to one vote with only Senator uh, Josh Hawley voting against it. Uh, why, I don't know. And the bill now is before the House. We hope that that will uh, pass in the House. And uh, of course we encourage the community's advocacy and support on that bill so we can get it through the House so we can get it before President Biden. And I'm very proud of President Biden too for speaking up as the ambassador indicated and also uh, our wonderful Vice President Kamala Harris, who's the first woman, the first Black, first Asian American Vice President. She's actually lived this. She's experienced this. She knows what hate is. So it's wonderful that we have those in the top leadership in our country uh, telling us that they have our back front and side. So, um, we, we are also asking that um, Asian Americans to report this when, when this happens. I know it takes a lot of courage, but you know if we if we stay silent, as the ambassador said, it's complicity, and we we want uh, not only Asian Americans to speak out and report these, but those who witness these attacks that are bystanders, and um, and also speak out, no matter if you're Asian American or whatever, to speak out on uh, at forums like we have today and on social media. And our community leaders right now, I know in Maryland, are working on public information campaigns. 
were getting out the word to both mainstream and uh, Asian American press. Uh, the business community is also assisting us. Uh, uh, we have major donations from like Westfield Malls who, is, who are assisting us in getting the word out through our outreach campaigns. And um, I have been working very closely with our law enforcement and our state prosecutors uh, and local prosecutors to help them recognize these attacks as hate crimes and work with victims in sobbing um, and uh, keeping our families safe because you know we, we can't solve these crimes or prosecute them unless the community comes forth and, and works with our local law enforcement because reporting is always a problem. If you don't report it, it doesn't look like there's a problem. And uh, so when the uh, Rockville family, the Shins were attacked um, months ago, three times, uh, we called the local law enforcement and uh, they came to our aid, they sprang to our aid and they're working now closely with our community. I've gotten a commitment from the um, Montgomery County Police Chief Marcus Jones to resurrect uh, an Asian American Pacific Islander Advisory Committee that existed before from a previous um, uh, police chief that held a seat. But we can't do this alone. We have to build and forge coalitions with leaders of the Black, Latino, Jewish, and NAACP and other organizations, which we have done in Maryland, to fight these hate crimes and uh, to help them on their common issues too. And I just want to tell you that we also uh, are working with a, a Columbia University professor. I don't, uh, Professor Weiss, you might know her, uh, Professor Agnes Xu Tang on her national information campaign called the Ye Yellow Whistle Project, We Belong, in which she has donated hundreds of thousands of yellow whistles to distribute it to those in our community and other communities, including 20,000 for our uh, state of Maryland. Here it is right here. It's like a bracelet. And um, can you see it? Sorry. And you wear it around your wrist. And if you, uh, you're a subject tech, you can you hear that? Okay, sorry. I hope I didn't hurt anybody's eardrums, but it's uh, it's something that we thought was critical. And I, I I just uh, commend the professor for donating this at her own, her own, uh, you know, donation of resources and everything. And then we're making everyone aware that our current about our current Maryland hate crimes. In particular, there was one that was passed just last year uh, to make it easier to prove a hate crime. Uh, because uh, previously, before this law, it was almost impossible to, to prove a hate crime. And this law was named in honor of uh, Bowie State University student and uh, U.S. Army Second Lieutenant Richard Collins III, who was stabbed to death by a white supremacist while he was waiting for a bus at a bus stop. And uh, the white supremacist, uh, Urbansky, his name was Sean Urbanski, he was convicted of the first degree murder, but the hate crime charge was uh, dropped. So we changed the law to make the impossible standard of motivated solely to motivate either in whole or in some central part. And we know that will make a difference. And um, I, I would have to say um, what makes our country so unique is our rich diversity and those things that hold that we all hold in common as Americans. So it's important that all our communities um, unite, come together to fight hate, racism, and injustices so that we can make this a better world not for, for all individuals and for, and for families and particularly our future generations. So um, thank you again for uh, Professor Weiss and, and, and everyone for having this forum and for having us to speak on this issue. Thanks, thanks so much, Senator Lee. Uh, and in particular, uh, uh, well, I will speak for myself because I cannot necessarily speak for others, but speaking for myself and like-minded persons, thank you for your leadership uh, in working on these problems. Uh, it is pretty easy to identify problems like this in our society. It's another matter altogether to step out and uh, promote, look for, find, and promote solutions. So thank you for your work. And I hope that there are many others like you in the political class in, in the great state of Maryland. Um, our final speaker is Dr. Theodore Gonzalez. Dr. Gonzalez is curator at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History and is currently serving as the interim director of the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center. 
Uh, a scholar of comparative cultural studies, Dr. Gonzalez has taught at in the US, Maine, and in the Philippines. He's a founding editorial board member of Along the Journal for Phil Philippine American and Dias Diasporic uh, Studies. Dr. Gonzalez, welcome to the Southeast Asia Forum. We're delighted to have you on our program today. Thank you, Bill. Um, it's wonderful to be with you, to um, Ambassador Romualdez, Senator Lee, uh, Hank Henderson, and to the staff of the US Philippine Society. Uh, it's my great honor to be with you all today. Um, I'm, I don't come from the world of policy. I'm uh, for many years, for nearly three decades, I was a university professor in, in Hawaii and in Maryland and now and also in DC. Um, in my current role working at a museum, um, one of the things we, we are paying attention to is, is the historical frame uh, to set everything in, in an historical context. And so what I hope to do in my remarks is to provide some of that historical context to think about how we are here, uh, because all of these moments, even though they are timely, they also are of a particular time. They also have a, uh, the, they bear the weight of, of historical gravity. And so what I'd like to do is, is to tell um, uh, a quick story about an object that I actually collected for the museum. Uh, it was actually during the pandemic. Um, and sometime in March of last year, the, all of the Smithsonian closed. And so we have 19 museums, nine research centers and a zoo. Uh, we're gonna be slowly reopening uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, but after a year, we've, we've had to shut down operations uh, for, for the nearly 6,000 employees and for the very large campus. It really, um, it really hurt us to be able to do this because there's uh, part of the mission of the Smithsonian is to communicate the, the gravity of history and to connect people around the world and also the United States uh, to these narratives. Um, to that end though, um, there were um, uh, guidances internally for us as curators to still collect objects uh, directly related to the pandemic. And so I wanted to make sure that, that at least a few of the objects that I was going to be collecting would pertain to Asian American experiences. And as you can tell, uh, we were now reacting to these questions of AAPI hate. Um, and this was back in, in March of last year where I reached out to contacts all around the country uh, I, I was put in touch with a retired Superior Court judge in San Francisco by the name of Julie Tang. And she was able to um, put me in touch with some contacts in San Francisco's Chinatown. She had actually helped to work with a local group there in San Francisco Chinatown to put together a rally. And this rally um, featured about a thousand participants. All of this taking place on February 20th of last year. So if you recall, I mean, I know this seems like last year, but it's, it does kind of seem like 10 years ago. Uh, but this was February 20th of 2020, just about a few days, a, a week before the World Health Organization declared the global pandemic. But on February 20th in San Francisco, Chinatown, a thousand people gathered in a rally and they marched from Portsmouth Square. So if you're familiar with that, it's, it's in, in Chinatown. They marched uh, south to... Um, the, where the Dewey Monument is in Union Square, about a half a mile's distance. So a thousand people, community organizers, uh, pastors, uh, as well as the local elected officials. Um, and the message of the rally was, was loud and clear. At the head of the rally was a banner, a 20 foot banner, 20 foot by four foot. And on the banner, it said, fight the virus, not the people. So Julie Tang and the organizers of the rally uh, agreed that um, uh, that they'd be happy to donate that banner to the National Museum of American History. So I'm I'm happy that we're going to be collecting that in, into the into the national collection. But it spoke to me in, in an interesting way because it wasn't just about that particular moment. And and, and what was what was fascinating to me was the the fact that the banner, uh, that rally, that particular time in San Francisco in San Francisco Chinatown, how did they have the presence of mind? to anticipate what was happening. You know, there, there were speakers at that rally uh, that afternoon, and they really spoke eloquently about commemorating those who were already sick in the city. That was also the same day that we would have the first US death up in King County in, in uh, Washington state, but they had, uh, this had not really broken toward the end of that day. But then there were also, there were other speakers on the rostrum that day that spoke about the other virus that was to be guarded against. And that other virus they pointed out was hate and bigotry. So I thought to myself, how is it that they're able, now we have the benefit of history to kind of think about the several months after that rally, how is it possible that that group 
that community had the presence of mind to anticipate history. And I, I realized I was asking the wrong question. They weren't thinking about the future. They, they, were, they knew what was to come, but they weren't predicting it. They were able to have that presence of mind because they had the presence of history. Um, the San Francisco Chinatown community, like a lot of Chinatown communities throughout the United States, had benefited from the long and painful legacies of the 1882 Exclusion Act, the 1875 Page Act. Now, those are, those are just the, the legal manifestations of what happened to a community, really painful ones where immigration policy was formally used to exclude a group of people, formally named in US law to formally exclude them. So if you think about 1875 and 1882, the same would then affect our other communities in 1924 with the Reed Johnson Act, another Japanese Exclusion Act in 1924. Before that, 1917 with the Barred Zone Act against South Asians. And then in 1934, the Tidings McDuffie Act, even though it was seen as a, an independence bill for the Philippines, there were nativists in the state of California that were organizing actively for the deportation of Filipinos from the state. And so whether it's 1875, 1882, 1924, 1934, all these exclusion acts coming to the fore and, and grounding uh, our experiences in, in the rule of law, we also have to think about the nativist forces that were marshaled to, to gin up those kinds of attitudes. So the, the experiences that I think we're experiencing today, the, this climate of Asian uh, anti-Asian hate, does have really old and deep roots in terms of nativist, um, nativist sentiment. While Chinese and Japanese and Filipino laborers are recruited to the United States for their labor, plantations in Hawaii, all throughout the continent, there's a point where also they become then formally excluded by nativists, uh, seen as foreign or filthy or diseased. So these questions are not necessarily new. The things that we're associating now with with the, um, uh, the, the way that, that politicians have, have associated people with disease. These are actually quite old. They are reflected in media. They were reflected in newspaper headlines, political cartoons, magazines, and then also then in popular film. And the way that the culture recirculates and recycles these notions of nativism is again, an unfortunate and enduring pattern of abuse against native, uh, against Asian populations in the United States. So while that may be the case, and while that is unfortunately a, a cycle, a tradition in American culture, I, I'd also like for the students to understand that there is an enduring tradition of resistance to those acts that Chinese, Filipino, South Asian, and Japanese laborers didn't take it on the chin at each of those times before those laws and after those laws had been promulgated, that people resisted them. They had to resist them in the only way that they had available. You have to remember it was a formally segregated country. So many of them resisted oftentimes anonymously, oftentimes alone, but they, they used whatever tools that they had. Sometimes they resisted violently, others resisted nonviolently. But I want you to understand as well that the resistance to the nativism has also been an enduring tradition in Asian American history. So we find that resistance coming to the fore again, whether it's the law, uh, the law cases resisting Japanese internment, or we have the Chinese American and Pan-Asian community coming together in Detroit in 1982 after the killing of Vincent Chin, a Chinese auto worker who was mistaken for being Japanese, an Asian American community who rose up to, um, to think about media representations of all kinds, Asian American communities have been coming together again and again. And when we think about this term Asian America, it's really a coalition. Uh, you know, I mean, we think about the, the geographic, the heterogeneous nature of Asian cultures and communities and nations. What binds us together is many, unfortunately, not only the things that happen to our communities, but also the ways in which we've resisted, oftentimes with Chinese and Japanese, often with African American and Latino workers. I'm thinking as well of the 1965 the Lano strike where Filipinos and Mexicans banded together after years of struggling oftentimes apart. Larry Itliong organizing with the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee in Coachella and Delano, oftentimes alone. But then in 1965, an opportunity arises where Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta with the National Farm Workers Alliance are then um, 
asked to join a particular strike. And that gives us the birth of the United Farm Workers that would change the world in the way that we think about the protection of agricultural workers and how vulnerable they are. They are still out there in the fields in the middle of our pandemic. So whether it's 1965 or 2020 and 2021, we unfortunately are repeating the, what, we're, um, what, we're, what is revealed are the same patterns of, of abuse that people continue to face. But again, even though the patterns of abuse might be recycled in the same, the patterns of resistance continue to arise. So I'd like to close some remarks here with this in a sense that one of our major tasks uh, as educators and as others uh, here is to, is to think about the long train of nativism that runs through so many of our histories, but to understand that also the long train of resistances continues unabated as well. Our education really is not just merely to resist nativism, it's not merely just to resist all of these forces, it is to recognize our common humanity, to realize that we are not merely others, and that for no matter how long we've been here, whether it's um, the settlement of Filipinos in Lake Bourne uh, in the 19th century, uh, or the more recent immigrants of, of refugees and others and, and Pacific Islanders in the Midwest, whether they came centuries ago or decades ago, we have to recognize the common humanity in each other, in our own Asian American Pacific Islander communities and with each other across racial groups. Uh, this is a, a high task uh, among the many important tasks that we have to deal with concerning climate change and the, and the growing inequality in our, in our environments. Uh, I, I, I hope that we can find common grounds to, to understand our common humanity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gonzalez. Uh, history matters. History matters both to those who made it and those who read it. It is an important part of the intellectual process of learning. So we are indebted to you for reminding us not only of how important it is, but what the facts are on this particular subject. I'd like to turn back to Ambassador Romaldis for a minute and ask, uh, ask you, sir, uh, about the uh, foreign policy aspects of uh, the anti-Asian violence in the United States and elsewhere. First, uh, what is what kind of blowback is there in the Philippines uh, about the violent attacks against Asians, Asian Americans? And beyond that, uh, what kind of reports does your Department of Foreign Affairs receive about uh, in increased attacks on Filipinos in other countries, uh, perhaps as a consequence of COVID-19? Well, uh, one thing for sure, Bill, is that uh, Filipinos in the, in the Philippines are extremely concerned on what's happening here. As a matter of fact, almost every, uh, every conversation I have with media people or anyone in the Philippines, it's always about what's happening in the hate crimes. And as you can see in the what happened in, on television uh, recently is the attack on this uh, on this 65-year-old uh, uh, Filipino-American uh, who was on her way to church, and uh, the other one who was uh, slashed from ear to ear in the subway. All these graphic, uh, 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 what they see, is, is is obviously making Filipinos not only concerned, and that's why our Secretary of Foreign Affairs, uh, Secretary Luxin, immediately called me, and but. We have been, uh, we've sent a diplomatic note, of course, to the State Department, and we've been talking to the White House. And uh, we, we appreciate, of course, what the Biden administration is doing, but, uh, and also what the local police, uh, especially in New York, for instance, they've set up uh, uh, a hotline where they can call and at the same time, um, uh, undercover uh, cops in, in New York, and in fact, they were able to apprehend quite a number of those uh, uh, hate crimes that uh, were almost going to turn violent. Um, the Philippines, as you know, we, we have a lot of overseas workers all over the world. And uh, one particular incident that happened in Kuwait, where one of our overseas workers, a domestic helper, was actually tortured and put in a freezer. Our president said that we are breaking our diplomatic relations with Kuwait. And we have so many workers there and we asked uh, them to be sent back to the Philippines. And of course, the uh, 
government of Kuwait, the Emir immediately reacted and uh, reached out to us and uh, uh, came to an agreement that we have to uh, do something to make sure and protect our workers. We have over 12 billion workers all over the world. All of them are hardworking people here in the United States. As you know, we have a lot of health workers and also uh, doctors, nurses, and many people who have worked hard and have achieved a lot. And like us, what Senator Lee said, most of us are relatives. She has her father who, is, who served in the US Navy. I have an immediate relative who is now buried at Arlington Cemetery. Uh, and they, they served in, in the US Armed Forces. All of these historical facts are what people, Asian Americans are achievers and that they've done a lot to contribute in this country. What I may suggest down the road really is for uh, people to realize that the contribution that's made by many Asian Americans to this country. Uh, media should play a major role. As you know, I come from media and I'm one that believes that really letting people know that Asian Americans have contributed more than anything else uh, uh, to many of the things here, um, not only in science, technology, and healthcare, and, and many aspects of, of society here in the United States, and they should know. In fact, something that was very uh, hit hard, really, it was actually an Asian American, I think in California, it was uh, featured in CNN, uh, where this uh, veteran actually spoke in a press conference and then raised his shirt to show what he went through when he was uh, tortured. I, I think it was in, in Afghanistan or in, uh, in, in, uh, in the Middle East. So that I think is, is, is what, what it is. People have to realize in this country, the contributions made by Asian Americans or all uh, peoples of different races into what this country is all about now today. That I think is one of the things that we should try to uh, emphasize and show to, to many Americans here in the United States. Well put, Ambassador, thank you. Uh, Senator Lee, I am curious because uh, concern about the upsurge in attacks against Asian Americans in particular seems such an obvious, to me, seems so such an obvious topic to breach the partisan divide in American politics. What, what is your experience in the Maryland legislature in, in uh, addressing these issues? Is it in fact uh, uh, another day in the partisan divide of our politics or is this an area around which bipartisan consensus is easily formed? Yeah, um, can you hear me now? Uh, Yes, uh, Professor Rice, thank you for that question. Uh, yes, it, um, when we have been uh, trying to pass hate crimes in the Maryland General Assembly, uh, we do have some opposition because I think there is uh, perhaps uh, a lack of understanding or there's a certain culture or there's just not enough information about uh, how communities of color feel or, or other communities like uh, uh, who are from different religious backgrounds or, uh, you know, LGBTQ, they they haven't lived those experiences. I think uh, because uh, you know some people live in different universes. Like for instance, the uh, when we did the we passed some major police reform bills uh, this last session. We were the first state to do that. Um, there was a lot of uh, opposition, but we did get it through. But it was because, uh, you know, if you haven't lived this, where you have to worry about telling your sons or daughters before they go out, if they're a person, if they're black or brown, if they go out and they drive the car, that if they're stopped by law enforcement, they have to uh, be a little bit more careful and perhaps they may lose their life if they don't do go through certain things like putting your hands up and not doing any uh, jerky moves or anything like that. So, and and uh, a lot of some of the opposition came from those who would not have to live through those kind of circumstances all their life. So they didn't understand that. But just like our hate crimes law, uh, there was a lot of opposition when we passed that hate crimes law that I mentioned to you about um, changing the standard of proof there, because if you didn't 
if you didn't live through that life experience, you you don't know. You you don't think it's relevant. So, uh, with res with respect to our hate crimes law, we have been able to get it through. And with the other side, with the, I'm a Democrat, Republicans voting for it too, but not without a fight. And um, I think that the January 6th uh, assault on our United States Capitol, the People's House, uh, showed us that we have a lot of work ahead of us, that our country still is uh, somewhat, uh, has different opinions on how we move forward. And uh, so, uh, but I'm glad that we have like a president and vice president that uh, understands this. And particularly Kamala Harris, our vice president, she's lived this. She, she is a living example. She, she knows this. She's a person of color. She's Asian, she's black, she's a woman. And she brings those experiences to, um, to our top office. And that makes a difference when you, uh, when you have a diversity in our political system, because then you're bringing everybody to the table and you're bringing every perspective and it makes for better laws and policies. And I'm sorry if I've gone off on, on tangents, but did I answer your question? But anyway, um, I'm, ho I'm hopeful, I'm really hopeful. You know why? Because uh, the, the US Senate just passed a bipartisan bill to deal with hate crimes against uh, our Asian American Pacific Islander community. And you know that the Congress for years, uh, previously, especially the last of the, the previous four years, there's been a lot of stalemate. Congress can't get anything passed, okay? So I was like overjoyed when I saw the United States Senate finally passing something, because we in the states have had to take over that role, that responsibility, because the Congress wasn't passing uh, important laws that we thought things like gun, uh, uh, gun safety, things like um, civil rights. And that's why we, the states had to step in, but then that's not good either because then you've got a patchwork of legislation and you know, hate, hate knows no borders. So I am just terrifically over wildly overjoyed that uh, the Senate passed it by 94 to one. And I think I am very optimistic that when that bill goes over to the house side, the United States, uh, House of Representatives, I think it will pass and then we'll get that bill before President Biden and he will sign it. And I think that will be a victory for America. Thank you, uh, Senator Lee. And I, I too was impressed by the 94 to one vote on Senator Hirono's uh, bill. I actually thought it was a misprint um, <laughs> because I'm not accustomed to seeing those kinds of numbers, but nonetheless, it, it was very encouraging. And I was hopeful that you could add some encouragement about what is happening in the Washington area as well. But let me turn for a moment to, Senator, to Dr. Gonzalez uh, and ask you uh, to comment, if you would, on this phenomenon of under-reporting of uh, hate crimes, because it, it because statistics, because data does drive decision making in our, not only in our legislatures, but elsewhere in our political system and sometimes, uh, often, not sometimes, but often in our social relationships. So this question of, of uh, hesitancy to report crimes, is there a cultural uh, foundation to this or is it, uh, is it a consequence of historical experience or some other cultural phenomenon that I might not uh, have mentioned, or is it simply a pragmatic choice to avoid by victims to avoid retribution? It's a great question, Bill. I, I think um, you know the 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 proper answer for complex questions like this is always all of the above. <laughs> um, so uh, it's not a cop out, but uh, these these are complicated problems. Uh, as I was trying to allude to, they are historically deep um, uh, problems. In that sense, they we enter into a cavern of experiences that, um, that are sometimes beyond us. Um, and they, they can be certainly dizzying for the person on the sidewalk who's experiencing it. Um, and and I, I think, um, uh, yes, uh, underreporting is, is a fact. Uh, there are other groups like Stop AAPI Hate uh, that was cre created out of San Francisco State University by um, our, our colleague, uh, Professor Jung, um, who um, immediately, as soon as the pandemic hit, again, had the foresight to kind of th to think about the idea that this, this reporting tool needs to capture the data that you're, that you're talking about, not just out of the FBI, 
Um, and then also to have a mechanism where it is multilingual. So there are people that are able to translate it in several languages. Uh, I mean, the thing that is, that's uh, amazing, but then also uh, um, uh, 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 an incredible dynamic to experience is the fact of, of the top 10 most commonly spoken languages in the United States right now, four hail from Asian countries. So not only Chinese, of course, but um, Vietnamese, uh, Tagalog, and Korean. Uh, and then also the variations of Tagalog with Cebuano and others, Chinese, Mandarin, and, and whatnot. But that's an incredible amount when we think about the linguistic diversity and how Asian communities are speaking the languages. Um, and, and, and that was the reason why Stop AAPI Hate needed to have on their reporting tool uh, uh, an ability to have multiple languages represented. So yes, I think there are there is uh, underreporting that that is definitely recognized. As to the causes of that, um, again, I, I think there we can point to certain aspects of cultures, Asian cultures that that wish to not rock the boat or wish to remain silent about such things. That could be true, but I also want us to think about the. Um, the, the terroristic understanding of white supremacy in the United States and what it is intended to do, which is to silence its victims. So whether it's African-Americans or Latinos or Native Americans or Asian Americans, the idea of what white supremacy also uh, bargains for is people's silence. And I, I, I think it's, that's not necessarily a, a, a representation of Asian American culture. Um, there is another tradition of Asian American culture, as I said, that that speaks loudly to its times. Um, there is a, an elderly woman in San Francisco's Chinatown also who responded to an attack on the street. You might've seen this as well some months ago, um, but when the tussling was over, this was on Market Street, so it was downtown um, and uh, an attacker came at her in the middle of the sidewalk uh, and she let him have it. Um, she is an elderly woman, younger white male uh, and she brought with her a two by four. I'm not advocating violence, but when we're talking about a woman who's defending herself, there was only one guy that went that left that scene on a stretcher and she wanted more of them. She wanted a piece of this person. So, you know, when I think about my families, when I think about my aunties, when I think about my mother, uh, I don't think about someone who suffered in silence. I think about a tradition that was loud. I, I think about all the other activists who were on the streets and continue to be on the streets. Yuri Kochiyama, Grace Lee Boggs, Noboko Miyamoto, all of these, all of these women who've been at the forefront of being uh, loud about their sense of injustice. Um, and well, you know, we could add that woman that was out there in San Francisco as well. She still had that two by four in her hand. Again, I don't mean to, to take away from the, the, from the philosophy and strategy of nonviolence, uh, but this is a woman who was on her own on that street. Um, and um, in, in, if, if we think about the underreporting, we have to think about what people are dealing with on the street and, and oftentimes all they have available to them uh, are, are those tactics. And so, Bill, it's a long way to say that, yes, there might be some underreporting, but then there's also some underreporting of how we, we're also, uh, people are fighting back in whatever way they can. Indeed. Well, thank you, Dr. Gonzalez. And, and I, I asked that question for that very reason, but for also an additional um, of Southeast, for, Southeast Asia forumish kind of question. I, to me, this is an area that uh, demands more social science research, more sophisticated research, so we can really explain and perhaps devise ways to counter this kind of hesitancy. But your point about resistance is well made and well taken. Um, it's our time now to turn to our audience for questions. Uh, Courtney has been uh, going through the questions and consolidating them and uh, uh, she will now uh, pose questions for our panelists uh, either uh, as one or collectively. Courtney? Indeed, and we, we do have probably more questions than we'll have time for in our final 15 minutes on the call here, so I will end up consolidating a few of them. Um, but I, I think the first question will return sort of to the international scene. So we've talked a lot about how this is, you know, a challenge domestically inside the United States. It's nuanced, it's complex, it's, it's political. Um, it's obviously also deeply impacting the way that the United States is perceived abroad. And so th this question may be most appropriate for the ambassador. Um, but broadly speaking, are there opportunities for U.S. embassies internationally to contribute in some substantive way to this discussion in addressing anti-Asian um, anti American and anti-Pacific Islander 
violence in the United States. You know, given that this is an international perception challenge and there, is, there are opportunities for the United States globally to engage on human rights and on equality, this is obviously a key challenge. So, you know, Ambassador, do you have any thoughts on this? And then after that, uh, please open up to the panel. Well, I, I think that the, the United States uh, has been able to contribute a lot to bringing out all of these injustices. Uh, and of course, everything that's happening here in the in the United States is, is very well uh, propagated all over the world. Everything that happens is the Black Lives Matter uh, and, and many other uh, uh, issues uh, confronting this country, especially on racism. Um, and and uh, definitely the United States can take the lead on this because they're experiencing what many countries are experiencing uh, in some ways. And like in the Philippines, as I said, uh, our overseas workers are, are, are hardworking people, but at the same time, there's a lot of incidents where they are abused uh, uh, physically. And, uh, and like I mentioned that they're, they're even uh, uh, tortured and given all sorts of uh, 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 racial and, and, and degrading things that uh, happen to them. And, and that's one of the things that we continue to be concerned about. And we always are, um, or all our embassies are out to protect our citizens, just like the United States would like to protect its citizens when they are abroad. Uh, so the U.S. can 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 play a role, and, and your embassies uh, should be able to at least assure uh, many countries like the Philippines, who have a lot of uh, Fil Americans here, and at the same time uh, workers. Uh, that uh, the United States uh, will not uh, uh, leave them uh, hang to dry, so to speak. Uh, that's very important for us, an assurance that is. Other, either of our other panelists care to comment? I, I think the ambassador said it well. Um, I, I think we all, we're all one world. And we're a small world now. And I, I thank you for your comments, Your Excellency. You're right on point. I, I don't think I need to add to that. Thank you. Courtney? So combining a few different questions, we had a, a number of people commenting on sort of the, the challenges of being a, mind, a model minority. Um, and also the, the challenge that minorities and, and Asians in general are often asked to sort of show or prove their worth to the American society as a whole. Um, you know, why is that onus on minority groups? And is there an opportunity specifically within the education system in the United States to try and help combat racial bias? So when you're looking at history of America as it's taught in schools around the country, um, are there opportunities to work nationally or at the state or local levels to sort of improve uh, inclusive and diverse representation of the important role that Asian Americans have played throughout America's history. So this, this was a broad question, but I think perhaps Professor Gonzalez may have the most uh, to, to add here. Sure, thank you, Courtney. I, I appreciate that question. Um, you know, concerning the idea of model minorities, it's often targeted uh, to Asian Americans uh, to see them as an exemplar, to see them in terms of uh, uh, household income, educational attainment. Um, and, and while those statistics are uh, uh, hopeful in, in terms of, of thinking about very narrow ways to, to understand socioeconomic status. They also are misleading uh, in, in many ways. Uh, and they're misleading and, and hurtful in others. And I can get to that in a second. Uh, they're misleading in the sense that um, if, if you are aggregating all of these groups into one, then yes, and you find a sense of, of uh, household income uh, being higher than the national average, for example. And it's often sometimes a repeated uh, ad nauseum in the press. The, the rate of household income by Asian Americans uh, above the national average. But this really goes to the, to the need to disaggregate the data, which Asian American studies scholars, ethnic studies scholars have been calling for for the last 50 years. So the, the, uh, to understand Asian America is, is also to understand how it is unified as a group, but also how it needs to understand the various ethnic groups within it. And to do so is to, is to find the disaggregated data that is always necessary to understand that it's not household income that is the best measure for uh, understanding socioeconomic status. Perhaps it's per capita income. And once per capita income is understood within the Asian American community, you're re revealing a large set of communities that are not experiencing the same fates. You're seeing Southeast Asians, South Asians, and other recent immigrants that are experiencing higher rates of illiteracy, 
um, uh, lower per capita income. They're not even living necessarily in the same neighborhoods as, uh, as others. The, the wealth gap within the Asian American community. And we don't get to that story un until we disaggregate the data. And then the idea of a model minority really falls apart um, because then it's what it, what it really is intended. And this is to the, heart, the, um, uh, the hurtful part of, of the myth is, is that it's actually used to discipline other racial minorities that to hold up the Asian American as a model minority is really then to to uh, create insult to African-Americans, Native Americans, and Latinos to say that they are not excelling as others. And so it, it puts people into uh, a, a, a kind of competition for, uh, uh, for those who are achieving. And it is, it is unfair, it's, it's, it's hurtful. And again, it's divisive when it's not getting at the actual data that is necessary. Who are the people that are suffering the most in our neighborhoods? And when we're thinking about Southern California, we have to think about the Cambodian population in Long Beach. We have to think about refugee communities of Marshallese and other Pacific Islanders in the Midwest. So that's not gonna be captured necessarily in this aggregated data um, that points to you know, all kinds of strange, um, um, a, a distortion of the reality. We get down to the ground level to understand how people are suffering. Um, we, we need the data that, that Bill has been talking about. Um, yeah, I, I, excellent, excellent analysis, uh, Professor Gonzalez. I, I wanna add something to that. I think it's uh, with respect to our community, we're not a monolithic community. Uh, there are things we, we share in common, but there are things that we're not sharing in common. And uh, we're not all successful um, model minorities. Uh, and I think uh, the problem is our, it's the perception of who we are. And I think it's important that the media um, not portray us as such. And I, I, I'm encouraged because now I see a lot of uh, journalists who are now um, of Asian descent, which gives me a lot of encouragement because we're telling our own story. Because it, it, these uh, journalists who are of color or of Asian descent they bring not only their mainstream pers uh, perspective as what their own surroundings and all the, the training and, and information they've received over the years, their foundation of their life experience, but also they're, they're also adding their perspective as a person of color. And so uh, I, now that I see, I mean, when I was growing up, all the journalists looked the same way, you know, they, they look, you know, you know, the same way. Okay, they were, you know, Caucasian. And, and if they were women, they're all like blonde hair. Okay, but uh, now I'm seeing a diversity and that like when you watch NSNBC, CNN or uh, in ABC, NBC, uh, I, I get really excited because I say, boy, boy, the person looks like me. And, and they're also uh, telling the story from their perspective too, but also from their mainstream perspective too, having grown up. So, uh, and also I think that the school cur curriculum has to have Asian American Pacific Islander history and studies in the school curriculum. Because right now we're kind of invisible, we've been marginalized. We don't even exist in some cases. And I think that if you, just like, uh, uh, you know, when, when they had um, things like black studies, that's wonderful. I think, I think that everybody, the story of those who built America, everybody who participated in making this country the way it is, their history has to be told. Too. Otherwise, it's incomplete. And so um, I think we, we have to do an education campaign. But anyway, that, I just want to add to what uh, Theodore had mentioned. Thank you. Courtney, Courtney, I just want to add one more thing to follow up on, on Senator Lee. The, um, the resources that we have at the Smithsonian actually help us uh, move toward um, trying to correct those, those kinds of distortions. So if folks are, are able to, to Google the following, it's called We Are Not a Stereotype, which is a series within the Asian Pacific America Center. It's a wonderful series of conversations that people have to really get at these conversations. Some of them are also data-driven uh, with learning labs um, and, um, and, and, and other um, educational tools that we have at our disposal, especially with, with, with millions of students uh, home because of the pandemic. Uh, we've really tried to ramp up our, our national education program to push out uh, resources to teachers, parents, and students. So if you wanna head over to smithsonianapa.org, you can see uh, the, um, the offerings that we have. And so we're happy to share that with everyone.
Yes, thank you for that, Professor. And I, I do know we had a number of questions, which I, I think, unfortunately, we're not going to have a chance to get through all of them. But there are three questions that were uh, pointing specifically to sort of the challenges and the need for better data and better understanding of data surrounding what's been happening um, and, you know, surrounding where, where Asian Americans are and ha have been for a long time contributing to American history. So we've, we've got about five minutes left. I'm going to ask a final question, then turn things over to Bill and, and Hank to close out. Um, and that's, you know, how do we keep this conversation going? And for those on the call and others who care about these issues, where are there opportunities um, at the state and local level for people to raise the profile of this issue? So this is, this is a broad a broad question. I think perhaps, Senator, if I might turn to you, I suspect you have ideas specifically for Maryland, how people can be involved in supporting further, further work to combat violence against uh, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, but this is sort of an open question to the panel to close things. At the, oh, oh uh, I'm sorry. I thought you were addressing this to Professor Wise. That's why it was quiet. So you want us to tell you all how we can address this issue, right? Um, well, we could have information campaigns. We should have better relationships and partnerships uh, with other groups like the Black, Latino, faith communities, and all different communities. We should be all working for the common purpose, which is to make sure this is a, a country where everyone can enjoy freedom and liberties. And we should also uh, work with our law enforcement prosecutors. So when th things like this happen, uh, that our community will not be afraid to report these incidences or follow it all the way to through through investigation to prosecution so that we can stop this activity. And we, uh, we have to do all things at the same time. And we have to get all the different communities, the business community involved too and uh, working with um, our, our grassroots community to see how we can coordinate our efforts to uh, make sure we uh, propel this issue to the forefront and that we're all working together on solutions. Well, let me just uh, add to what uh, Senator Lee, I think, uh, well, she herself uh, has played a major role in, 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 in bringing the, the profile of this uh, anti-Asian hate crimes. Uh, but I just wanted to share with you uh, my experiences whenever I meet with U.S. senators and uh, even leaders here in the United States. Uh, we have a lot of issues that are, are, are we discuss on, on my meetings with them, uh, for instance, with uh, Senator Hirono. But because of a large uh, community that she has in Hawaii, we inevitably talk about the achievements that have been made and the communities that she, she has uh, served in her state and she's very proud of them and she's very appreciative of them. These are the things that I think uh, people should know that there are a number of Asian Americans all over this country that have done very well. As a matter of fact, I, I also remember uh, at one point when we had, uh, when I accompanied our president to a state dinner at the White House with uh, former President George Bush he actually even said that I have uh, a lot of Filipino Americans here serving in the White House. And he says, I get my foreign policy advice from them. So, you know, things like this is, is really what it is. Uh, there are so many of these things that uh, we experience that people should know that there are so many Asian Americans all over the United States who have done extremely well serving this country in, in all kinds of, uh, in, in, in many capacities. All right, well, if Professor Gonzalez doesn't want to come and then Bill, I think it's over to you and Hank for closing things out today. Well, thank you, uh, Courtney, and thank you uh, for your to the panelists for your uh, responses to our questions. I neglected to say at the outset in my opening remarks that uh, we partner with the U.S. Philippine Society in producing the uh, Philippine Roundtable uh, as a uh, activity of the Southeast Asia Forum at Stimson. Well, we do indeed partner and have for some time. And uh, the one of the key uh, leaders of uh, our partnership is the executive director of uh, the US Philippine Society, Hank Hendrickson. Hank? Thank you, Bill. The US Philippine Society values very deeply the partnership with the Southeast Asia Forum, uh, with Stimson, with you, with Courtney, with Brian Eiler. Uh, and we want to continue to do this. I think we've got some things teed up 
uh, for next month, and we uh, look forward to that. Uh, Bill, I think, and Courtney, you would agree, this has been one of our most distinguished panels. Uh, and I, I mean that sincerely. We've been at this a long time. We appreciate uh, the work of old friends and new in this uh, and congratulate Theo Gonzalez on his new position uh, and uh, for letting us know about plans to open the Smithsonian. We look forward to getting there um, and uh, in working with you in, in personally, uh, individually and live, but also uh, to avail ourselves and those in the audience of the resources that you have. And Senator Lee, can't thank you enough as a constituent uh, for the work you do and the leadership you show. And uh, Ambassador Romualdez, uh, as always, we really value your perspective, uh, which is crucial to the work of U.S. Philippine Society. And Senator, you should know that uh, the Ambassador has a wonderful team. And uh, I hope the, that this event has connected you all in a way that can last beyond uh, this program uh, and to look for uh, ways to work together uh, in, in both uh, on this issue and others. I just will make two quick observations. One, on terms of the foreign policy aspects of what we were discussing today, it's a real no brainer that in the 21st century, the Asia, the century of, of Asia and Asia Pacific, to have the United States uh, be looked at as a place where there's uh, bias or violence, even in some incidents against our Asian American Pacific Island community is completely counterproductive to what we're trying to project overseas. And so it's, it requires a collective effort to combat that. And I, and I hope that uh, we can all work together on that. Domestically, uh, the United States benefits enormously uh, from the uh, participation in our society, in areas of uh, commerce and business and education, science, uh, from the Asian uh, Pacific Island community. And we want to make uh, our country welcoming and respectful, and we can do that by addressing these issues that we discussed today. And then lastly, I take this opportunity to recognize and salute the work of particularly Filipino American healthcare uh, workers who have saved lives, who have put themselves at risk to fight this pandemic for the past year. And in the face of uh, occasional uh, personal incidents, but just in the, in the face of some of the problems that we've been discussing today, it's, uh, we, we need to recognize the contributions in facing what has been our most pressing challenge, which is uh, defeating this COVID and moving on beyond. So Bill, with that, uh, thank you again uh, for doing this in Courtney, Senator Lee, Ambassador Romualdez, and Dr. Gonzalez, thank you very, very much. Indeed, and thank you, Hank, and thanks again to the U.S. Society for your unstinting support for the Philippines Roundtable and the Southeast Asia Forum at Stimson. We really appreciate it. We couldn't do it without you, and we probably wouldn't, so thanks. Uh, first, let me, in closing, thank our very learned panel of experts again. Uh, you have been absolutely terrific. I agree completely with Hank Hendrickson that you are one of the most distinguished groups to, uh, that we have engaged with, and we would love to do it again because, sad to say, there's some possibility this question will not necessarily go away with COVID. It's worth exploring under different circumstances in perhaps some similar ways. So we hope that uh, you will come back to, to visit with us again, but for the time being, Ambassador Romualdez, Senator Lee, and uh, Dr. Gonzalez, uh, thanks for your participation in this really excellent uh, presentation. Second, I, I wanna thank our audience for joining us to get today and asking such interesting questions. I apologize to members of the audience who did not receive uh, a moment or have their, their questions uh, asked, as we always do, I am happy to receive your questions by email and find the person on our panel who can answer them and get those answers back to you if you are interested in us doing that. Uh, finally, uh, please be sure to join us for the next Southeast Asia Forum seminar in two weeks on May 12th. We'll be discussing China and Southeast Asia uh, with uh, two well-known experts on the subject, Marvin Ott, of Johns Hopkins University and Yunsun, our 
colleague at Stimson. Our next Philippines roundtable will be in three weeks on May 19th. Our topic then will be what's ahead for Philippine politics in 2022, the year if you are not already aware of the next presidential election. So thank you again, all of you for participating. Until next time, stay safe, get your shots and be well. And thank you for joining with our forum. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Hank. Thank you, thank you Senator.